Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with the City of Cold Lake Mayor, Craig Copeland. Cold Lake is a vibrant city characterized by its sunny natural beauty and the dynamic community spirit. Situated on the shores of Cold Lake, its crystal clear waters offer endless opportunities for outdoor recreations, from boating to fishing to hiking to wildlife spotting. The city boasts a rich cultural tapestry with festivals celebrating its diverse population. Home to CFB Cold Lake, it also embodies a strong military presence. With a thriving economy driven by the oil and gas sector, coupled with the picturesque landscapes, Cold Lake is a welcoming haven for both residents and visitors alike. So stay tuned as we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Mayor Craig Copeland. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs. And they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Mayor Copeland, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the man behind the persona of a mayor for a second. I've got to ask the question <laughs> that I've asked every single person who's ever come on the show. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Craig? Well, probably uh, my parents. Uh, my parents were very involved in sports uh, back home in, in uh, southern Ontario. So uh, they were big t-ball coordinators, uh, ran a big, huge t-ball uh, league uh, back in uh, Mississauga. And so, you know, I watched my parents uh, give back to their community and and uh, and sort of I, I when I was a young kid uh, and my teenagers, I actually coached t-ball and baseball and and uh you know, played a lot of hockey, lacrosse, and then when I moved out to uh, to Cold Lake, eventually I, I took up uh, coached uh, hockey. So I tried to do a little bit of research on my guests before they show up, <laughs> just because I want to learn a little bit. But the one thing I look at is the the electoral history of my guests. And the last election I can find that you stood in was two thousand and four. Is that correct? That was the first election you stood in. Yeah, I, I ran for council in 2004 and, and got in. And there was a lot of people that ran that year for council. And I think it was like over 20 some odd people that ran for the six spots. And then I got in as mayor in 2007 and been the mayor ever since. So what was going on in 2004 that made you decide that I want to get involved in my municipality? Because I could have still done the volunteerism. I could have continued mm -hmm. on with hockey. But 2004, you said, let's 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 join council because that seems fun. <laughs> Right, right. Well, actually, it kind of happened by accident. I really wasn't a political monster at all. I, uh, my parents had moved out here uh, from Mississauga to help me raise the, my two daughters, and uh, and and so their house uh, filled up with sewage actually after owning it, and uh, and so I kind of wanted to know about the infrastructure of the city, and so the city staff did a great job. Uh, teaching me about how the plumbing works and uh, they also share with me that uh, the city's really not investing in in the infrastructure and you know I thought okay uh, my mom always caused me called me a rebel without a cause and so I I, I ran uh, you know I ran in the council that year I did not get in and then uh, I ran in 2004 uh, and um, what was going on in the city there there was uh, you know a lot of infighting within the existing council and uh and so I just ran on in 2004, you know, wanted to serve my community and, and make it a better place uh, to live. And looking back on your tenure, because you're coming up to 20 years in office now, yeah. have you made the city of Cold Lake better than when you first were elected in 2004, do you believe? Well, I think, you know, a mayor is only as good as uh, his counsel with them and, and with him and her and, and, and administration. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I, I'm pretty confident that we've made a huge difference in our community 
um, you know, from the undergrounds, plumbing and sewer, uh, to right to recreation, um, just the, and the and the look of the city. Um, you know, I've experienced uh, on council a tremendous growth phase that the city went through, and then uh, you know some significant uh, changes to our revenue stream. Uh, we managed to uh, get some industrial tax revenue from uh, the oil sands operation uh, into our city, which has tremendously helped uh, us be able to do some of the infrastructure that we have in our community. Has the role of the municipal government changed in those 20 years, do you believe? Well, I, you know, the last couple of years have been pretty rough. Uh, there seems to be, you know, people are much more... Um, involved in terms of you know really wanting uh, not, not only accountability but just seem like there's a lot of anger out there right now and uh, so um, you know I think it's much more difficult to be a, a municipal politician than it was back uh, you know when it first started um, there's a lot of whether it's social media but there's a lot of information now uh, that is accessible uh, to the residents uh, and they're really becoming more engaged and Everybody seems to be leery about the information they're getting as being uh, the truth. But, uh, uh, you know, people are, they know how to get a cold year real fast now with, with the, uh, with you know, text messages, phone calls, it, it's changed somewhat. Um, it, you know, it, it'll be interesting. It, it is much more, um, people are more angry. That's what I've noticed. Probably the biggest change from now to back when I first started, there's a lot more anger uh, out there in, in, you know, in generally, right. Do you think there's any more, there's more apathy when it comes to municipal politics? Because the, and I, I say this as Chris Brown, the host of the show, not the mayor of yeah. the city of Cold Lake, but yeah. I, 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 I used to cover municipal politics 20 some odd years ago back in Ontario before moving out here and covering politics. I, I would be hard pressed to see people not show up to a r random <laughs> Tuesday night council meeting. But now you look at council meetings and they are basically council administration and that's it. And there's a Zoom link that you can watch or a YouTube channel you can watch. Do you find more and more people are just tuning out of what's actually happening in the municipality the council table and just more just frustrated with the way that things are in the world in 2024? Yeah, um, maybe. I, I think uh, our city tries very hard to make sure that we're very open and transparent, whether it's on the YouTube channel that people can watch us live. I mean, that's a big change uh, being live. And, and you know, and, and we do a tremendous amount of press releases. We, we are... Uh, because there's kind of been a void in media from the old days where print media was covering in a big, big way. Right. And doing editorials and, you know, complaining about the mayor and, you know, whatever. Right. And now uh, people are going to, uh, there is a, some, uh, like we do have a local paper that now is coming to our, our, uh, our council meetings, which is fantastic. Uh, but we're trying our very hard to make sure the public knows uh, you know, what's going on in our community. And so we'll, we'll be issuing, you know, one, if not two press releases a week. Uh, we have a great communications team uh, that works for the city. They're actually, some of them are former newspaper people. And, uh, and so, I mean, they, they do great press releases. They make me look so good. Um, you know, and, and thank God I don't write them. Uh, my English isn't very good. And, uh, and, and but uh, great team there. And, and so we try to, whether we have some public open houses, but we try to be very transparent and get the information out there. Uh, we've had quite, you know, in some hot issues, we've had uh, council chamber, you know, where the council chambers have been full. Um, but by and large, you know, when it's voting day every four years now, um, you know, we still don't hit the high numbers, you know, our, you know, we're, we just don't get, to, like you said, there's apathy out there. But, uh, you know, people can complain. They'll, they'll email you and, and complain about whether it's taxes or my streets are not, you know, cl clear of snow. Um, but when it's voting day, it just seems to be a lot of people just mail it in, right? How you talk about the people who complain. And I, I want to just pick up on that for a second because I want to ask the question that I ask a lot of municipal leaders because I think there's a blurring of jurisdictional lines that we're seeing in Canada right now where the average resident will come to a municipal councillor like yourself, a mayor or councillor or reeve a warden, and they'll ask issues because you are the closest to the people. You're most accessible. Yeah. You are the closest to the people. And they may ask you questions on infrastructure projects that you have no responsibility over or healthcare that you literally have no responsibility 
responsibility yeah. over. Are you seeing in Cold Lake that blurring of that those lines? Because you 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 your your city that's a unique beast in some sense because you have the a military base, which is a federal regulated organization. You have provincial and uh, mandates, which is the hospitals, education, and then you as the municipality have your own jurisdictional roles that you have to play. So I can imagine you're dealing with not just municipal issues in 2024 that you were dealing with probably not in 20, 2004 when you first were elected. Yeah, 100%. No, you're absolutely correct. It's actually getting worse. Uh, so people think you have a lot more power than you really do. <laughs> Certainly the healthcare, I think, uh, since COVID, during COVID and then after COVID, I think healthcare is probably being the number one where, you know, what municipalities we've been asked you know they call it downloading but there certainly has been a downloading of um you know um, people think that uh you know they want their municipal leaders to be more involved in decisions at the hospital or, or for or, you know medical issues in their community and so uh, mayors and reeves and, and uh, councillors very engaged with the province to try to improve of course health care in their community um and so that wasn't a real big um back uh, back in alberta uh, years ago they used to have the health boards and then they got rid of the health boards and so it's sort of being fallen upon to municipal leaders now to really carry the torch when it comes to health care uh in a perfect world um you know maybe um maybe the municipality should be more involved in actually education and and health care where the uh, the money just flows to the to the to the municipalities and they make the big decisions uh, on their hospital and, and and their education system. I mean, other countries do that where they, the the municipalities are 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 running um, and it's just a transfer of budget dollars. You know, there's I'll, de I'll definitely tell you if, if Coal Lake had uh, any healthcare money, we would be getting an MRI machine tomorrow. I mean, it's we don't have an MRI machine in our city the service uh, from Lloydminster to Coal Lake or Laclabish and down to Vegreville. Um, this whole area does not have a dedicated machine. Uh, we rely on what's called a mobile MRI, which is ridiculous. And uh, so just little things like that, where uh, out in rural Alberta, uh, it's very difficult to have, you know, full, you, you know, we don't expect to have a brain surgeon at the Coal Lake Hospital, but when you look at all the people that are flowing to Edmonton and just dumping into the healthcare at the hospital that's there, you know, why can't we pull some of that uh, services and pull it into whether it's Coal Lake, make it a regional hospital. But, you know, there's little things like that where, you know, you, you know, our highways, uh, we're, we've been complaining uh, last while on highway 28, the condition of highway 28 and, uh, and up in our area, what a lot of people don't know is, is the coal like oil sands produce probably about three billion dollars a year in royalties to the province and and, and the feds and, and and so you know highway 28 is just in ridiculous condition right now and yet uh we just aren't getting our share of provincial dollars coming back into the infrastructure up in this this area here this northeast i call it a forgotten area uh, and so all the mayors and reeves have been really lobbying to try to get more you know more provincial dollars up here I don't know if I answered your question very good, but, but you, you, you did, uh, but I, I want, I, I want to just mention something before we go into this, because I, I think this is the perfect opportune time to say this just to let everyone know, this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. He is the head of the council, but he is one vote on said council. This is not a motion no. of council, not a direction of council, not a policy of council. This is his opinion and his opinion alone. I just want to make sure because I will get very emails good. if I That's do not great. say that. <laughs> I want to ask this a question because you have just touched on about five things that I want to talk about. And if we're going to jump into this, let's jump into this right away. You talk about Highway 28, you talk about healthcare, you talk about education, you talk about the issues that are facing your community right now um alberta province just released their budget earlier this month or actually end of february a month ago almost um was there anything in there for you uh there was a, just a tiny little like i think it's around 20 million dollars out of in, in, in basically in our whole area you know our region but the city itself uh there's of course the province gives municipalities uh funding uh through lgff so municipalities get a dedicated you know, amount of money. It's about a, just under two hundred dollars per capita. Basically, comes into uh, into the city. So three, you know, three to four million dollars will come in through the province. Um, but it's 
you know, it's a small chunk of what runs uh, your municipality, whether you're Edmonton or Calgary, Coal Lake, it's a small chunk. So there's more and more uh, res- download to the, the actual rate payer, the t- uh, resident and commercial. Uh, uh, and that's why you're seeing your taxes, municipal taxes going up right now in the province is that uh, there's nowhere to go except to either you cut service or you uh, have to go to the taxpayer because the, the province and the feds have been slashing back what they're giving back to municipalities. Right. And so it just hasn't cut uh, caught up. And so, um, you know, we got a small amount, certainly what we're looking for on a capital side is, an, is to help with our wastewater treatment plant that we're short of money for. We've written to the province on that. Uh, they've given us some money, but we're asking uh, because of uh, cost escalation and all these construction projects are all going through the roof. Uh, we're still short on, on that, on that project by quite a few million and just highway 28 where we were hoping that highway 28 was going to get in the capital plan for the 2026, 27 construction season. Uh, the province is funding right now a, a design study, but uh, we were hoping that we were going to see a bookmark uh, where whether it's a hundred million or whatever was starting to be placed in, in the future and three years from now saying, Hey, yeah, the province is committed to, uh, you know, fixing that highway. A lot of these issues that you're talking about, and and it's not official downloading onto municipalities because they will f- uh, fund it, but it will be at a later date. They will say than they as the province. But right here, right now, you know that the your municipality is growing at a substantial rate, and your that wastewater treatment facility plant that is not a quote unquote sexy thing that people want to come and see every day, but it's required for a municipality. Uh, from what I understand, the municipality went through their budget deliberations back in December and early January. Correct me if I'm wrong there. But was this a tough budget year for the city of Cold Lake with everything that's going on in the world, with inflation the way that is, the way that the economy is going, and now with the federal government and provincial government sort of scaling back on even grants and uh, uh, sort of uh, operational costs that they usually supply, but they're not anymore? Yeah, well, it was probably the worst budget um, (laughs) because we couldn't do, we couldn't do, we couldn't do very much. Uh, So we have a couple of big projects. Uh, so we've uh, trying to fix a major road right along by our marina. It's called Lakeshore Drive. And so um, what's happening there is our, our bank is actually slipping into the lake. So we actually have to come in and put a big seawall uh, there uh, on the, the waterfront and then come in and replace all the underground water and sewer on that road. It's quite a lengthy road. And so that project, of course, uh, you know, we're tackling it during uh, the, this, this inflation that we're seeing in construction. So that project is sucking a lot of the, the city uh, available capital dollars plus debt. And uh, so one of the big changes, of course, is, is uh, debt is, is now really where you're, you're having to go and pull that lever now in the municipality. So um, there's just the opportunity to get provincial and federal dollars is lacking. And so now you've got to use debt as your friend to try to finance um, some of these projects. And so you build the debt payment into your, into your operating budget. That's how it kind of works. And so uh, when we did a 5% tax increase, you know, some of that is in there. And also, we're also trying to build a brand new uh, public workshop. So we got two big capital projects. Uh, our public workshop is embarrassing for the staff. It looks like Sanford and Sons, uh, that old show back on TV, right? And I so, feel old uh, right now, all, Mayor. I feel old. Yeah, there you go. There you go. And so, you know, they've been waiting a long time. I mean, it's it's not a very nice place. And so we're building a new shop. So we get these two big projects going on. And then add on this social unrest that's going on in our community where we have a tremendous amount of homeless people, uh, crime. And, uh, and so, you know, unfortunately, the city in the uh, in this year's budget, um, we had, we put in a, a couple of hundred thousand dollars towards uh, uh, security. So security twenty four hours a day uh, through a private sector uh, entity, and working with the city, and then uh, more and municipal enforcement officers, so that we're running a twenty four hour shift, and, uh, and having a presence out there. Um, we we estimated our homeless population or people that are living rough at over 130 people. And uh, that was up from 50 uh, the year before. 
<clears throat> so we also fund, funded uh, uh, the John Howard Society, which is a, a bunch of beautiful ladies that have uh, volunteered their their time to run a run a homeless shelter here in Coal Lake, and so they've gotten provincial money to operate. And uh, the city came in and, and and bought an old drilling camp from uh, a drilling company and moved it to Coal Lake, and we stood up about a twenty bed uh, homeless shelter. Um, but, but you know we have about uh, we had over a hundred tents uh, out in the bush all around Coal Lake. And uh, so what we've done is come in and try to take the tents down. And because we had over 23 fires in uh, 2023 that the fire department had to put out from the, the shelters uh, that people were building in the bush and, uh, and also our landfill, they're, they're actually sleeping in the landfill and causing major fires in our landfill, which is very dangerous in a, in a landfill. And uh, so just trying to, uh, deal with that whole social issue that has just exploded in uh, since COVID. I'm going to ask a sensitive question because we're talking about this issue right now, but I, I have to, uh, because you've said a few things. I just want to make sure I'm clarifying here. Now you have to make these tough decisions as a council, you mayor and your council have to make these tough decisions of putting money into these uh, areas that you see are of concern is the residents are, are the residents of Cold Lake telling you that we need to fix this issue, or is this council doing it on their own and trying to sort of be proactive and then instead of being reactive to some of these issues? Do you get a sense from the community that the community is behind you in supporting these twenty four hour measurements of uh, security, uh, more uh, funding for homelessness, more funding for sort of mental health and addictions that we are seeing? Is the average is the residents of Cold Lake behind you? In this move to sort of help address this issue because the province is failing and i'm saying that as chris brown not the mayor yeah yeah you know i don't know if the province is failing i, I think they're trying I, I, minister nixon is trying as hard as they can to okay. to make uh, make it better out there it, it has just exploded uh with the meth pro uh, problem that we're having the drug i mean it's just that i mean you got people out on the streets that haven't gone to bed for five days and they're just out on meth right and so we have a lot of people that need help if they're willing to get the help. So I think the province is trying hard to catch this, this, this moving rocket ship. So I, th I think Minister Nixon and his staff are really trying hard to address it. We, we as a city <clears throat> are fully supportive of the minister if he wants to uh, put a, uh, an addiction uh, facility here in our community uh, or in our general area. We're very supportive of that. We need a detox center. We don't have a detox, um, you know, professional detox facility in our area. So it's concerning because you have so many people that need help. And then, you know, tie in the mental health issues. Um, I mean, it's kind of sad when you drive around and, and you know where to go find them and in our community. And so what, what happened is, is that uh, we had a lot of uh, social workers uh, that, you know, saw this train coming a couple of years ago and wanted to get involved with, with uh, having an overnight stay ability. And, uh, and so that stood up uh, the shelter a couple of years ago and not everybody was in, in love with that idea. And so as a council, we made the decision to go into it uh, because what was our option? So the people were coming into our community, uh, about 95% of the people that we're talking about are not directly co-lake uh, citizens. So they're coming in from elsewhere, coming into your community and staying. And um, so it was very common that they would go to a lot of the restaurants and try to beg for food or, you know, get disturbed. So at the shelter, they get three meals a day. So they're getting fed and that way it takes some pressure off of the, uh, the restaurants. The issue has been, and they, at 11 o'clock at night, <clears throat> the doors are shut and they have to stay there till seven in the morning. And there's a bunch of rules. Of course, they don't want to follow the rules. I mean, they, they still want to use their drugs, but they put their all their belongings and everything they're carrying into a room, locked room, and they spend the night. And there's, you know, there's rules that they have to follow. And unfortunately, some of the residents, the clients don't want to follow the rules and, and they're evicted because you got to put your foot down. Um, but they're given three square meals a day. Uh, the food bank here in Coal Lake has been amazing, uh, providing uh, a lot of the food for the John Howard. And, uh, and Coal Lake has been known for a, a really giving community. Like the food bank, I, the last update I got, it, is about 400 families are getting fed 
uh, at the food bank. I mean, there's a lineup out the door when it's food bank day. Um, so the, but the issue is, is that where do you locate a shelter? And nobody wants it close to them. And that was probably the most, you know, that our problem as a municipality is the city doesn't own a lot of land. And so we found a spot. Not everybody was thrilled with the idea, but we did find a spot. Unfortunately, the businesses where it's located are, are dealing with what happens when they open the door at seven or eight in the morning, the people leave and they wander around mostly the Southern part of Coal Lake. They do get, <clears throat> they do get on our transit system and, and move around a bit, but try, primarily they're in Coal Lake South. So that comes with other issues. And, uh, but we also have an element inside Coal Lake where we have a lot of crime and that is more of an organized nature. Now, some of the, the people that are living rough, I mean, they're not all angels. They are causing, you know, some theft, but uh, we do also have organized crime in our, in our municipality. Um, I mean, our council's never shied away from the fact that this is all going on. We take it by the, you know, we deal with it. We're trying our best to, this is our, you know, we're taking down the, the tents. Um, and if you need a place to stay, here's the shelter. But what happens, is, especially when the weather gets warm here, the people that are living in the tents do not want to go in the shelter because there's rules. They can't use, you can't, you know, use their drugs or drink. Uh, and they want to be uh, together in their, their tents and their little community. And so what's neat, neat is that you'll have little, I mean, maybe it's not neat, but anyways, you'll have these little pockets of tent communities. Um, they don't all stay together. So they have little uh, areas where they all go camp out and they don't all get along. So, um, somebody could probably write a pretty good thesis uh, what, uh, on what's going out in the bush right now. It's challenging for a municipality right now, especially one that, and you've been honest with me, and I take you at face value of what you're saying is going on in your community, and I would not ever accuse you of lying, and I don't want to. But I've got to ask this question. This seems like a very challenging moment for your municipality. You are sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place because you are addressing issues that of are concern to, I would say, I would assume the majority of your residents, health, care, homelessness, safety, crime, drugs, you name it. These are on top of minds for a lot of people right now. As a municipality, how do you balance the needs of those issues with the needs of the issues that are just, and I don't want to say municipal issues because these are municipal issues as well, but the service levels at the library, because when you take funding from one spot and put it towards other mm -hmm. areas, you now have to say to people, unfortunately, we have to reduce the hours at the ice rink or at the soccer fields, or we're not going to be cutting the main street yeah. or you, this, that, or the other. How do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the issues of the community? And I've never asked that question, but I think it's an imp important question to ask you because you've been so open about what's going on in your community. Well, you know, um, it, it, this is what people vote vote the seven of us in. I mean, um, <laughs> but you know, we're 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 really fortunate in our community was we have great um, administration. So the staff do a tremendous uh, job. The CEO and his all his general managers and their staff in writing um, professional reports for council to review. And we one thing we do do is we take our time on making uh, important decisions. And so we kind of chew on it and then uh, try to go out, get the information for the council and bring it back to them. Um, a lot of initiatives in Coal Lake are actually driven by the public. So um, a lot of the key stuff that's actually created in our community um, is being created by a, a, a group of individuals. And so for the homeless file, it's a bunch of, uh, you know, some beautiful people that got behind, most of them are all in the social field that, that work with all these people. And we're concerned, where are they going to sleep uh, tonight? And uh, so they stood up a shelter. And uh, so, I mean, they've taken some heavy hits um, themselves. Uh, it's exhausting. Um, whether they're burning out, we'll, we'll see. But uh, it's it's a big workout. And in the homeless file, you always have to ask yourself a question is like, who's responsible for the people? And so, you know, who's, who is the what entity is responsible for 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 the them? Is it where the community where they came from? Is it the federal government, the provincial government, the municipal government? When you look at the municipal government role, the homelessness really isn't in our mandate, right? Water, sewer, fire, police, whatever. But when it comes to homeless people, 
especially when they're not from your community, but they're here. And um, everybody's dealing with it. Even small communities out in the middle of nowhere in Alberta right now have people that are living rough. And, you know, in some cases, uh, some of the clients uh, are on age uh, and other income that's coming in anywhere from two, say, two, I, I've heard stories of 2000 to $2,400 a month and they're living at the shelter, but it's all going to their drug use. And so, you know, we, we have, we have a, a big problem right now with this meth and, and uh, fentanyl and, and we need to, this has come out of nowhere. It's not the, the, you know, the 26 ounce liquor bottle anymore. This is, this is these uh, synthetic drugs that are really uh, manipulating everybody. I mean, there's a, a lady that I know that walks the streets and she's probably, in, you know, she's probably a young lady, but she looks pretty old now. And uh, half the time her bare skin is showing because she has no real wherewithal to cover herself up from uh, the elements. Right. And so they put, uh, they get uh, brought over to the hospital and they get into your hospital system and then they, you know, they're involved there and then eventually they'll get released and they're back. The cycle continues. Right. And uh, it doesn't seem to be getting any better. And our, our, our healthcare system here is clogged up and in for mental health and is the only place to get the overnight stays is in St. Paul and they're full, they're full. And so it's, uh, it's tragic because uh, you can see where we've been in just two short years. And we've been talking about on council is like, what does next year look like if we're already on this, you know, big, huge uh, elevator ride? Uh, are we at the top of the, the top floor or is this thing going to keep on going? I I, I'm anticipating it's it's going to get worse. I, I don't see it getting better. And and that's unfortunate, right? I'm going to ask a, another very political question. Where's the RCMP <laughs> in all of this? Where's the RCMP oh, in this? Because I, 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 I'm oh. not trying to be rude about that because there's issues going on with the RCMP. Should we keep them? Should we go to an Alberta police force? Mm-hmm. There, There's that. I, and I understand that conversation and I want to take that out of the way right now. I've got to ask that question the RCMP doing enough or do you need more resources from the RCMP? Because you talked about adding 24 hour security, adding more enforcement Mm -hmm. officers. And that seems like something, okay, if you're adding more officers, maybe it's time for the RCMP to add more officers as well in conjunction with the municipality to help in alleviate some of these issues that you're facing with, because if you're talking about organized crime, if you're talking about meth that is just rampant on your streets, I'm assuming there has to be a silver lining here that someone's going to step up and say, okay, maybe we should be looking at Cold Lake a little bit harder at potentially adding some more officers into this location. Yeah, 100%. So uh, the RCMP uh, have been fantastic in our community. And I think the issue for them is, is that there's tremendous frustration that they'll They'll deal with some of the same individuals, you know, repeat offenders, get charged for mischief, etc. And they're basically released. So the court system, the federal court system will not put anybody away for any duration. And so uh, so you've got some of the homeless people that uh, continuously are in front of the judge, but they're, you know, they're basically, uh, you know, given very light sentences, if any time in a provincial or federal judge, a jail. And so for the RCMP in defense of them, their job is is really, really, uh, there are, it, the, their, their hands are tied. Uh, literally, and um, and we need to be able to put uh, people that don't want to follow law and order away for um, whether it's a minimum security type of prison, but we need to put people away for a year or two uh, for you know, in my opinion, for um, continuous mischief charges, right? And so right now they're not, and so they just you're, nobody's learning from their mistakes, and so. Uh, there's no consequences. And so the RCMP, uh, I, I wouldn't want their job at all. I mean, um, so in, right now, how it works in Cold Lake is because of our population. Um, if we want to have another RCMP officer, uh, it will cost uh, just over $200,000 in our budget to fund another position because we're 90, we fund the RCMP 90% now. Um, and so it's one of the weird things about Alberta and how, how the uh, RCMP um, contract works. 
by the province. So those that have the population pay more. And if you're a small municipality, you pay less. And so if we want more RCMP, it's going to cost us. Now, what we've been saying is that the province has put sheriffs in Calgary and Edmonton. They you know, brought in sheriffs and all that. And what we're saying is that that would be nice if, if um, either the sheriffs or the province steps in and, and, and provides more uh, staff for the RCMP. Um, so that it's not a burden on 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 the rate payers. Um, you know, it, it's not like uh, have you, drugs have, are rampant. Have, but, have you had yeah, that conversation have. with Mike Ellis, the deputy premier and the uh, yeah. minister of public safety? Yeah, we've met with uh, Mr. Ellis and and uh, Justice Minister Amory. Uh, we had a beautiful meeting with with uh, with with the Justice Minister. Uh, we had a great meeting with the Crown Prosecutor up in our area. It, it all boils down to the federal government needs to change, um, you know, the, 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 the sentencing for, for crime. And, and uh, Coal Lake is always in the top 20 for what's called crime severity index. And so we anticipate, unfortunately, the, when the 2023 stats come out, we are, we're anticipating that Coal Lake's can be really high. And, and that is because it's a sort of a formula on how they rate certain crimes. And so say for, if you have a murder in your community, it's given X amount of points. And then if you have mischief, it's given X amount of points. We have a lot of soft crime in Coal Lake. And so, but we have lots of it. So you, like I said, some of the individuals will have, you know, over a hundred charges in a year and, and each charge gets scored. And so what happens in Coal Lake is our, you know, whether it's assaults, uh, you know, everything adds up. And, and that's why it's not like we have murders in Coal Lake. It's just that with all of the different activities that's going on, our, our CSI number gets really high and it paints the community in a bad, a bad light when, in fact, you know, our community is a fantastic place to live in, uh, top notch uh, recreation facilities and a beautiful lake. And, and uh, I mean, beautiful outdoors out here and, you know, great school system and all that. It's just that. Unfortunately, we, we have this other element that's inside our community, just like other communities in Alberta. Uh, we're not unique to it, but somebody going back to your homeless thing, somebody needs to step forward and be the, the guardian of who's going to be responsible for the homeless people. And, um, you know, whether it's the federal government or the provincial government, somebody needs to step in now in a big, big way and say, we'll be the champion and the province is trying, but is that is that fully their role? Where's the federal government in this? And I'm, you know, our homeless population is just a small micro, you know, small population compared to what the Edmonton and Calgary is going through, right? So you kind of touched on it there a brief second, but I've got to ask this question because I don't want people to go away from this interview thinking that Cold Lake is some place that you should never visit. Um, yeah. Give me a silver lining here. Give me a silver lining. You talked about some of the the, the tourist de destinations we we're going to talk about in a few minutes, but give me a silver lining that Cold Lake is not this place where you don't want to go because it is rampant yeah. with drugs and rampant with things that are going on. Give me a silver lining that Cold Lake is a place that people would want to come and uh, like see and sort of invest in yeah you know a great good example is the military so when they the members get posted into Coal Lake that have never worked here before you know they're oh it's up up northeast in alberta it's three hours away from a major center a lot of them come up here you know gosh i don't know if i want to stay and then a lot of them don't want to leave when they when they've spent some time here and so you know if you're a fisherman or an outdoors person like hunting or quadding um camping you know, we are, in, we're blessed up here with one of the best lakes in all of Alberta to, to, to be on. Uh, we have, our, our city does a lot of festivals. Uh, we have a great beach here, one of the top beaches in uh, in Canada. And we were voted the best place to watch the Northern Lights. Um, so, you know, we've got, a, we've, we've, our council over the years has thrown a lot of money into recreation. We're very rec, uh, so if you have uh, uh, kids our, um, with us and the MD of Bonneville having the, uh, the Kinnisus Ski Ridge uh, Resort, uh, you know, arguably we have some of the best hockey and, and baseball uh, soccer fields. Uh, we have a beautiful artificial turf field, uh, good school system. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's a great place to, uh, to, to raise a family. We, um, we have pretty much all the shopping um, stores that you can possibly need, but we don't have Costco. That's number one request we always get. But um 
you know, it, it, it is a good spot to be in. Uh, it's just this other element that is going on that is unfortunate. But, uh, you know, if you like to go lake trout fishing, uh, Coal Lake is probably the best drive to a uh, lake to go for lake trout fishing in Alberta. I've got to ask this question because when I, when I Google Cold Lake, the first thing that always comes up is Highway 28. You talked about <laughs> it a little bit earlier, but I've got to ask a little bit more into this because uh, as I have listeners across Alberta and across Canada, most people would go, why is this such an important infrastructure project for Cold Lake? Because it just seems like another highway that needs to be fixed. But for you, for, as the mayor of the community, I can imagine this is something that you deal with on a regular basis. So why is Highway 28 such a vital importance to the community? And why is it upgrading it such a vital need for the future of your community and the future of the Northeast of, uh, Cal uh, of Alberta? Yeah, for sure. So if you look at the road system, uh, especially when you get south of Edmonton, you have a lot of highways that go east, west, and north to south. But when you come up into uh, that are in really good condition um, and, and with out a, a lot of population, especially uh, east of the Red Deer uh, corridor. If you look at the Coal Lake, um, it's the only highway that goes from Edmonton in northeast direction up to Coal Lake. It's about 280 kilometers. It's never been improved. It's a single uh, narrow highway that uh, is faced with, um, so you got the military, the, the four wing coal lake that's bringing up all their jet fuel now by, by, by trucks every day. And you also, it's the, it's the main road that, uh, that the uh, uh, oil sands, the big heavy equipment uh, that, that is involved in the oil sands, it, it first kind of gets moved out of the Nisku Leduc yards, goes up uh, highway 36 and then 36 meets 28. And they got to they got to continue on Highway 28 with these big, big, wide loads up to the oil sands operations, whether it's up by Imperial Oil or up, uh, you know, Foster Creek, uh, CNRL sites. And so you get these big, heavy mod moves, uh, and you'll have 20 to 30 vehicles behind. Very, very dangerous. The big thing on Highway 28 also is that all your bus routes for all the communities along the way all put their kids on Highway 28, and they're going down country roads and turning right or left. And it's a huge safety concern. So we've lost a lot of people, unfortunately, on Highway 20 to serious accidents. So it's a it's a highway when you look at some of the other highways that have been done in the province, uh, Highway 11 or, you know, the beginning of Highway 3, 43, uh, you know, and and up the one up the Grand Prairie. We're just saying, when is it our turn? And we just feel that the highway's been totally forgotten over the years and and it would be different if we didn't have the oil sands up in our area. Um, we probably, you know, we probably would be patiently waiting. Uh, but unfortunately, you've got an area that's producing about half a million barrels a day of oil. And we're just, and the oil companies, you know, they've been very polite. Um, but they're wondering when the province is going to invest up in our area. Also, they, they keep giving, we're the gift that keep, uh, keeps giving, but we're not getting anything back. And uh, I, I, you know, I'm, just, I'm, ju I'm jumping in here for a second because I, I'm hearing that same sentiment from a premier to Ottawa right now. It seems like oh, yeah. uh, taking a page out of their book, <laughs> your book here. Uh, yeah, we've been we've been saying it. We've been saying it actually, uh, Chris, a lot longer than, than Premier Smith has been. Um, you know, this isn't our first uh, rodeo uh, this year on complaining about 28. We've been in this business for, you know, writing the, the campaign campaigns, meeting ministers. Uh, my entire time as mayor, um, people are frustrated. Um, and for some reason, we're just not getting the love. And, um, you know, people are getting tired of waiting. Um, you know, we had a couple of big events in Bonneville uh, with Premier Smith at some uh, UCP dinners. And Highway 28 was the most asked question of the Premier uh, both times. Um, and that's with uh, you know 700 people in both times at that event. I mean, the residents up here, you know, want to see the province start to invest up here. And, you know, I realize that, uh, you know, our growth will not compete with Calgary, Airdrie, uh, you know, uh, Cochrane, uh, Edmonton. There's just no way we can't compete with it. So when you look at the capital, what's very concerning is there's billions of dollars spent in that corridor, right? And so as more and more people move to Edmonton and Calgary, uh, their infrastructure is going to be, you know, they're going to be pointing fingers. 
And so, you know, for years, uh, the province has been investing in the big cities and the fast growing mid-sized cities at the expense of rural Alberta, which is feeding uh, the cash machine to, to do all this work. And, and so I think that the province needs to sort of take a time out. And I know I appreciate they want to pay the debt down and all this stuff. But I think that what they got to do is look at the areas that are producing tremendous wealth, uh, easy wealth. And what I mean by that is that this, these, these oil plants, you know, it's 150,000 barrels a day. Um, they're, most of them are all paid out in terms of uh, the cost it took to, to do all that investment. And so they're getting tremendous amount of royalties per day. And why isn't the province saying, okay, you know, we have to give back X amount to this area so that it sustains itself. And so, um, you know, whether it's investing in airports to move staff around much more safely, but little things. And, and what we're asking for is Highway 28. Why don't you invest in that highway? And I'll give you a good example. I was on a big, uh, behind a big mod move. Uh, they were going up to, uh, to, to um up to northeastern BC on a big gas play, and the, and the guys came out of the Nisku yard with these big wide loads, and then they got onto Highway 28, and we were stuck behind it for about an hour as they moved this big heavy equipment. They just stopped the traffic on both sides of the road, and I asked the guy, "How does this road compare on your entire route up there?" He goes, "This is the the worst Highway 28. This section is the worst uh, road, except one other segment that they had that they had to travel." But it's sort of you know the, the, the people that do all the wide loads they know which highways are the worst and all the truckers will tell you, right? I mean, if you go on 28 right now, it's uh, like one of the counselors said last night, uh, Councillor Bailey, it's like, you know, a cheese grater, just walking and driving on a cheese grater. And uh, I thought that was pretty cool. And, and we had a complaint the other day, actually, of a patient going uh, by ambulance to Edmonton on 28 and the pain that the individual was in inside uh, the ambulance was enormous. Um, a let's fix highway 28. I think we need to start a campaign around that. Uh, <laughs> two, um, uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing highway 28 up close and personal when I come up to cold Lake later on this summer, because as I've said to people, if you come on the show, I come to your community and spend economic oh, dollars nice. there to, so I will be up in cold Lake later on this summer. And I've got to ask the question because we're wrapping up and I'm cautious of time. And I realize we're over the 45 minute mark. So hopefully you have a few minutes here, but what are some of the tourist destinations that people should come and see in cold Lake? You talk about the outdoor recreations, but what are the hidden gems that you always want to boast about when people talk about cold lake yeah well there's so much to do but there's some really neat uh, uh, shops in cold lake for sure uh some neat uh, you, uh restaurants uh, scene that we have really good uh, food here uh but things like the cold lake museum is kind of a gem that uh, people if you have about three hours uh, that's pretty cool uh, lots of lots of stuff it's got it's combined with the uh, history of the area plus the air force so the air force has a an amazing uh section in in the museum um, but certainly uh, for us, the marina, the marina is like the, uh, the, one of the largest inland, inland marinas in all of Western Canada, uh, about a 250 boat uh, slip marina. Uh, and, and that's the, the setting along the marina at Kinisu Beach is, 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 is fantastic. We've got a great beach that I'll, if the day is really hot, we'll have about a thousand people on the beach. We do Canada Day, like small town Alberta, and it's fantastic. A lot of fun. Uh, we have a great parade and we give out candy still to the kids. Um, and we usually put on a pretty good concert and a beer gardens. Um, certainly the air show uh, in uh, around July 19th, 20th is going to be amazing. It's the hundredth anniversary of, of the Canadian air force and uh, the RCF and uh, the air show is going to be amazing. It's uh, ticket sales are going really good. I don't think you can get a hotel room in Coal Lake, um, uh, but um it's, we're expecting some big crowds there, probably up as much as 40,000 people over the two days. And then uh, we put on some uh, festivals, an Aqua Day Festival in August, uh, long weekend. And then we uh, Feast on the Beach is put on by the Chamber. It's a, a food truck venue uh, with two days of bands. And so, you know, we put on a lot of uh, music. Uh, there's going to be a, a, you know, a big treaty, uh, uh, all the uh, treaty one to 11, I think it is. Is all coming up to uh, the Coley First Nations this this year. We have we have the famous uh, painter Alex Janvey's gallery is is here in Coley. Uh, Alex's work is uh, you know is shown around the world. 
Um, so yeah, lots of lots of neat stuff to do. Uh, we've got an old trestle bridge that goes over the Beaver River. So you have the Iron Horse Trail that smarts, starts from Smoky Lake and uh, people can quad on it and bike. But uh, the trestle bridge over the Beaver River is pretty impressive. It's the old wooden trestle bridge. Where do you go after a long day of council meetings? Is there a place in the community <laughs> that you go to decompress? Because it doesn't seem like you have much decompression time with everything that we've yeah. talked about in the last 45 minutes. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I love to fish. So I go out my boat and just go out there and, and I'm not a very good fisherman, but I, I like to try to, to catch them. I watch a lot of people catch fish in front of me, but I uh, usually I'm, 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 I'm going for lake trout, but just to get on, on the lake, it's, it, it really is breathtaking. Um, you, when you get, there's very little housing development on that lake. So you feel you're like you're in Northern Canada. Um, and then, of course, in the wintertime, I'm a big hockey fan. So I go out and watch the kids, uh, the minor hockey kids play hockey or the junior hockey clubs that we have in Coal Lake uh, play hockey. So I'm a big, uh, that's, I like a box of popcorn and, and watch hockey in the wintertime. So my last question for you, we started by talking about you. We're ending by talking about the city of Cold Lake. And I've got to ask the question that every mayor knows how to answer, but let's put it on the record. What makes the city okay. of Cold Lake such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Uh, I think it's the people. I mean, we've got uh, a great community of people here and, and very friendly and uh, in a beautiful setting. And I, I just think that, uh, you know, I think it's the people of Coal Lake that, that uh, separate us. I, I think once you become part of the community, it, it's tough to want to leave um, and, and the amount of people that volunteer. So I think it's the people. Mayor Copeland, thank you so much for doing this. It's always a pleasure to sit down and uh, I look forward to visiting Cold Lake. And I'm I, I, I'm going to say I'm not looking forward to driving Highway 28, but I'm looking forward to the experience. <laughs> no, there's other ways to get up, uh, up our, our, to Cold Lake oh, without uh, avoiding I'm 28. Do, <laughs> I'm going 28. You, probably, you said it's a cheese okay. grater. Let's go. Thanks so much. All righty. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all the diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to love. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.